levels of measurement and why do we care about them in the context of statistics or social research. One of the best ways to identify like why we care about this has to do with the rules that are associated with levels of measurement. So the first thing right out of the gate to know about levels of measurement is that they determine the kinds of statistical tests that can be performed with our data. Uh, and so like an immediate concern that you should have in the context of Poly 399 is that in order to correctly identify the kind of statistic that you can use with your data, you need to know its level of measurement. And so that level of measurement needs to be correctly matched with the appropriate statistical test. Now, part of this is going to be easy because I will be teaching you a small number of statistics to run, and I'll be explicitly telling you if you have this kind of data, um, so if you have nominal data, this is the statistic that you should run with this. If you've got ordinal data, this is the statistic that you should run. Um, so part of this is being able to get that content down pat. But then the other thing that's really important is being able to correctly identify the data that you've got. Uh, and once you can do that, then you can match the appropriate statistic to the kind of analysis that you want to do. The second reason why you care about levels of measurement is that it depends on the thing that you're measuring, right? So if you go back to the lecture on concepts, one of the things that concepts help us do is to categorize uh, into just different categories, classify into a rank order, or quantify into something where we can do mathematics. And so that conceptual definition is telling us um, something really important about the thing that we're trying to measure. And so if our concept only allows us to categorize, then usually the level of measurement for the observation that's associated with that only allows us to categorize as well. And so understanding uh, clearly the thing that you're trying to measure is also going to tell you quite a lot about um, your options for your level of measurement. Uh, the other thing that level of measurement term rests on is how we actually went about collecting our data. So a lot of survey questions, for example, um, give us some kind of order, but um, we often can't get too high of a level of measurement with it. And so if we want a certain kind of level of measurement, we have to match our survey question to it. Similarly, if we're doing an experiment, the difference between say a treatment group and a control group, something that we'll be covering um, very shortly, uh, that sort of thing uh, is the lowest level of measurement we got. Those are just different categories, right? Context analysis, content analysis is the analysis of text. And so the choices that we make in terms of how we actually want to analyze text um, will definitely have a big effect on things like levels of measurement. So if you've taken poly 397, um, you should like some of these ways of like gathering data should be familiar to you. And the choices that you make in your data collection will directly affect your level of measurement as well. In general, the rule that we have with this is that we want to collect our data as as like at the highest level of measurement as possible, because we can always ask the computer to make it more blunt. Um, but we usually can't ask the computer to make a lower level of measurement a higher one, but we can go down from a higher to a lower. And so usually when we're doing data collection, we want to um, get as fine grained, more detailed information as possible. And I'll explain what that looks like in a moment. Uh, as noted just a moment ago, uh, levels of measurement provide a basis for classifying into categories, comparing or ordering, and quantifying. And so this is that connection to those concepts, again, and that the properties that's being measured. And the other thing that you need to know is that all of the rules that apply to the lower levels of measurement also hold for higher levels of measurement. So the rules are cumulative. Uh, and so when we start with the lowest level of measurement, all the rules that hold for that hold for everything else. We're just adding rules as we go up to higher levels of measurement. So these are the four options that we have for measurement. We can measure at the nominal level, the ordinal level, the interval level, or the ratio level. So our lowest level of measurement is nominal, then we have ordinal, then interval, then ratio. So all the rules that we have for the nominal level of measurement hold for the other three. And as we move up from nominal to ordinal, we add new rules. As we move from ordinal to interval, we add, like we have all the rules from nominal and ordinal, and then we're adding new rules for interval. And as we move from interval to ratio, we've got all the rules from nominal, ordinal, and interval, and we're just adding like more rules on top of that to get to ratio level data. So. What is nominal data? What is nominal measurement? 
This is simply categories. So if you think back to the first tutorial, you worked with nominal data, political parties. This is a really good example of a variable that's measured at the nominal level. Different parties are just different categories. Uh, you can't say that one is more or less of another. They're not in a rank order or a hierarchy. They're just different bins to classify uh, into. And when you're dealing with all nominal data, this is exactly what you're working with. So this is going to be the, uh, as long as you can just have different categories and that's it, you've got nominal level data. Now here's a key rule that's associated with nominal data, particularly when we're working with a computer. What we need to do is to make sure that um, we, we're giving the computer like a number to as a placeholder for the category, but there's a reason why it's called a numeral on the slide. So a numeral is simply like a label for a category. And that's the category that the, what the label that the computer is using, right? And so if you think back again to that first tutorial example, uh, I was looking at political parties. And so I labeled the first category. So conservatives, I gave them a numeral of one. I gave the liberals a numeral of two, I gave the NDP a numeral of three, and so on, right? Um, this doesn't mean that the NDP is like twice as much conservative. Like this doesn't make sense. They're just placeholders for the categories. And so when you're working with your data, you need to remember that you need to give each category its own numeral. The really important rule with this is that all the categories need to be exhaustive, so there has to be a place to put every observation and it needs to be mutually exclusive. So you can't put an observation into more than one category. So there's really only one place for an observation to go, um, but there's always a place for it to go, right? Here we're just dealing with different categories. This is like chocolate, vanilla, strawberry, um, different types of political parties. If you're measuring gender, um, well, it's understood, theoretically speaking, that gender is a continuum, and similarly, sexual orientation would be a continuum as well. Um, for the purposes of how we'd measure this in a survey, usually, I would see them as different categories um, that you're not going to put into any kind of rank order, right? Something along those lines. Uh, any question that has a yes-no answer would be nominal. Um, if you're asking people what province they live in, this would also be nominal. They're just different categories, right? How is ordinal different? If you're asking yourself, ordinal's got to be different because we're introducing a rank order, then you would be correct. The kicker for ordinal is that we still have mutually exclusive, exhaustive categories. So completely mutually exclusive, but also exhaustive. Uh, so every observation can go into one category and one category only, but there's always a category for it to go. But with this, we actually have um, an order. So we can say that there's more or less of something. The key for ordinal data, though, is that we can only say that one category has more of the property. We cannot say how much more of the property that they have. And the reason why is that we do not know if the distance between each category is equal. And we don't know if when people are answering a question that they're thinking about the distance between each categories uh, as equal as well. Like we just, this is information that we don't have. And so we have to operate as if we don't know that those distances are equal. A really good example of this is something called a Likert scale or a Likert style question. These questions are usually uh, anything that measures something on a, like, do you agree or disagree with this particular statement? And then people would be given the option to say that they strongly disagree, that they disagree, that they agree, or that they strongly agree, right? And if you think about that, you can see that there's a clear ordering of agreement, like strongly disagree to agree, but we have no way of knowing if there's like a standard way for people to be thinking about the distance between those categories. So for some people, the distance between um, disagree and agree could be huge. Uh, and it could vary by the kinds of things that we're asking them to agree or disagree with, right? Um, and the distance between if somebody is strongly disagrees or just disagrees, say, could be a lot smaller. Um, and so in that sense, w we have good reason to believe that the gaps across categories will be bigger or smaller depending on context and depending on the thing that we're asking about. And so we can just say that there's an order and we absolutely have to respect that order, um, but we can't say that the gaps between the categories, um, we, we have to assume that they're different. 
we have really good reason to assume that they're, they're different. So what does this mean for interval data? So again, we've got mutually exclusive exhaustive categories in a variable. We have a rank order that we have to respect. But if you're saying, oh, interval means that I have even intervals between my categories, you would be correct. Uh, interval means that we know that the distance between each category in the thing that we're measuring, that they're the same uh, or that they are even. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is that we can, still can't do math at this stage. So we still can't say that one observation is twice as much of the thing that we're measuring um, as the other because um, zero usually means something other than zero. So a really good example of an interval scale is temperature. If we're looking at the uh, centigrade temperature scale, zero doesn't mean the absence of temperature. Zero means that um, water freezes. It's analogous to 100, meaning that water boils, right? But we still know that the difference between like 9 and 10 degrees is like the same gap as the difference between 53 and 54 degrees, right? And so the steps that we take on the measurement are even and identical no matter where we are in the scale. It's just that zero usually means something uh, It means something other than zero. Like it, zero is a numeral that we're assigning meaning to. Zero is not the number zero. It doesn't mean the absence of the thing that we're measuring. It means something else. So analogous to temperature, uh, we'll often ask something called a thermometer scale, where we're going to be asking people, um, on a scale of zero to 100, how do you feel about politicians? Or how do you feel about this particular politician or that particular politician? And one of the things that's really clear is that we'll say where zero means that you really don't like them and 100 means that you really do. And so if you think about zero being very cold or like um, to the, at the point where things freeze and 100 meaning the point at which things boil, right? This is a good analogy for these kind of thermometer ratings that we use for to see whether or not people like or dislike um, politicians or groups or things along those lines. Um, so zero means something. It has a substantive meaning. Uh, one of the things that you're going to have to ask yourself in this context is if you think that a reasonable person would be looking at, say, that zero to 100 scale, and just like we would for like degrees Celsius, think that the distance between, say, a nine or a 10 is the same as the distance between a 53 and a 54 on that, like, how do you feel about this politician scale? And I think most people would reasonably look at that and say, yeah, I think the gaps between like nine and 10 and like 54 and 55 are the same, right? The assumption that you'd have to make to say that that thermometer scale in a survey context um, was not interval is that you'd have to be able to credibly argue that most people, when they look at it, would think that there are um, bigger or smaller gaps across any of those numbers between zero and 100. And I think that's a more difficult argument to make than to say that most people would look at that and say that they thought it was an even scale all the way through. Uh, other examples of this are often how we ask people about political interest, um, where they'll actually not political interest, political ideology. So political ideology um, is when we will measure it on a zero to 10 scale where zero means the furthest left position and 10 means the furthest right position and five is literally smack in the middle. Um, and this is one of these things where zero doesn't mean the absence of ideology. Zero means left and 10 means right. Um, and so we've got like substantive meaningful labels associated with each one of those numbers. Uh, and there's an order. So you can go from like more right to more left, things along those lines. Again, the thing that you have to ask yourself is whether or not a reasonable person would look at that scale and say, I think that the distance between a two and a three is the same as the difference between a seven and an eight. Um, reasonably looking at that, saying that moving from a zero to a one to a two and so on and so forth is an even interval. And if you are comfortable saying that, then that would be an example of interval level data. Okay, the very last option is ratio. So again, all of our categories are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. There's a rank order um, with even distance between the categories and perhaps unsurprisingly, zero actually means zero. So we need ratio level data to do mathematics um, because zero actually means zero. And for the purposes of math, this matters. So a good example of ratio data would be anything that you can count um, is ratio. 
So sometimes we'll ask people, how many days do you consume the news? Uh, and people can say, I don't, I consume the news zero days in a given week. Um, so usually we'll measure this like zero to seven for days of the week, or we'll measure it in terms of hours. And so when people give us a zero on that, we know that they actually mean that they don't do it. Right. Um, this is also where political interest comes in. And so when we ask people about political interest, we'll often measure it on a zero to 10 scale, where we say zero means I have no interest at all in politics, and 10 means I have a great deal of interest. And so in that context, zero means the absence of the thing that you're trying to measure. Like zero means zero. Um, you got zero votes. Literally, you got no votes. Um, things along those lines, right? And so in order to differentiate between interval and ratio data, you have to seriously think about what zero is doing. Is zero just a numeral for um, something that is substantively important that we care about? Uh, or does zero mean the absence of the thing that we're trying to measure? Uh, if it's arbitrary, so like degrees Celsius, arbitrarily zero means where water freezes, that means that we have interval data. If zero is not arbitrary and zero literally means zero of the thing that we're trying to measure, like zero votes, zero coalition partners, um, zero candidates, things along those lines, then we've got ratio level data. <laughs>